Demonstrators from around the world are calling for tangible solutions from their governments outside of the U.N. climate summit. The Climate Justice March was held in Glasgow on Saturday. Demonstrators are demanding faster action to combat the, the growing effects of global warming. On Friday, more than 2,500 students also protested outside of COP26. World leaders have been working for the past week to accelerate their plans to tackle climate change. Several governments have pledged to curb deforestation and carbon and methane emissions, but demonstrators say that they've seen similar promises broken before. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has called the summit a, quote, PR exercise. For more on this, I want to bring in Frances Cologne in Glasgow. She's a senior director for international climate policy at the Center for American Progress. Frances, thanks for being here. So what have world leaders accomplished at the conference so far? Well, I think what we have seen at this conference, which is different maybe from other conferences, is that the urgency of the moment can be felt. And leaders are really stepping up, not just government leaders, but private sector leaders and others with concrete plans and pledges and commitments uh, to the work that they're going to do to reduce emissions, to buy green, and to really do something different this time. And one of the things that is different is that every country has started to feel the impacts of climate. Um, the urgency is being felt in the people around the world. There isn't a single country that has not already felt the impacts. And so we're seeing commitments on, for example, reducing methane, 105 countries, which represents 70% of the global economy. Um, the G20 countries have all committed to no longer finance uh, foreign investments in coal. So a lot of very concrete commitments that have never happened before, um, and a lot of private sector stepping up as well, a, a first movers coalition that includes Amazon and others committing to buy green. Um, and so there is a different feel, but understandably, uh, folks have waited a long time for this. And so protesters are really urging faster, more accelerated, and more concrete action. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that he has concerns that COP26 won't lay the groundwork to put global missions on a sustainable path. Why is the summit receiving so much criticism? I think people have felt the impacts. They've waited a long time. And what happens here is, is a two-week-long slog of, of, of conversations that not everybody is privy to, right? Um, there's been a lot of talk about how inclusive or not it has been, how, the, how many folks from civil society have not been able to access sessions because of COVID, because of restrictions and limitations in space and spacing folks out. Um, so that has been a part of it. Um, folks want to see concrete, immediate action. Um, things are definitely different, but I think it should be said. Um, this is laying groundwork. Very concrete and, and important commitments are being made, but this is not the end of it. And so we have to understand that the climate crisis is, is quite uh, large. It, it is a big challenge and everything will not be resolved in the next week. We have one week left of this. Everything will not be resolved. We have to understand that the big commitments that are being made here is what we have to hold folks accountable to and that this is the beginning of the implementation phase of all these commitments and of further pledges that need to be made. The president of COP26, Alak Sharma, tried to temper expectations before the start of the meeting. He said that making progress will be more difficult than it was at the meeting that established the 2015 Paris Agreement. Why have expectations changed since then? Well, uh, we have, in many regards, lost a bit of time, a uh, very critical time that we needed. Um, for example, the U.S., as you know, was absent from the climate table for five years. Um, and what we have seen is that commitments that were made in Paris um, were not upheld. Not only the emissions reductions, but the financing pledges that were made were not upheld. And so now the science tells us our window has closed even more, and we have to take bigger actions, more accelerated actions. We have to commit more in every sense, from finance to emissions reductions. And so that is becoming a, a point of countries having to really look at their plans and say, where can I do more? Because now we have to do things faster. 
Well, the United States and European Union have signed on to a global pledge, uh, as you mentioned, to cut methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030. But several major emitters, like China, Russia and India, have yet to join the pledge. And those countries account for about 35 percent of methane emissions, as you're well aware. For our viewers who are questioning whether it is effective for these pledges to happen when other big nations aren't participating, what do you say? I say two things. One is that this 70 percent of, of the global economy represented in the pledges that were made is, is very important for our reducing of these methane emissions and really putting a curb on warming. Methane is a very potent gas, 80 times percent more potent, 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So really limiting this is going to help us re limit global warming. I would also say that the pledges countries make and the actions they take put pressure on those that have not acted. And so part of what this two week period does is bring countries together and make folks more, make folks more accountable, um, make them have to look each other in the eye, look their people in the eye, because the pledges you make or don't make, you're making in public and your people are going to see that. And so this isn't a problem of just governments. This is civil society that is here to help put that pressure. And we're going to see a lot of this have effects down the line, even after COP. On Tuesday, President Biden said that China made a, quote, big mistake by not showing up. Russia's Vladimir Putin also didn't go. Uh, I understand the argument that 70 percent is, uh, is still significant, um, but is the summit really successful without their involvement? I think the summit is successful to the degree where we say concrete plans were put in place. Countries are acting on these plans, the countries that were here. Conversations with China and Russia have not stopped. There are uh, negotiators here for them. They are present in, in different ways. And we have to think about those big goals of, of net zero by 2050 as one part of how we solve this problem, but also the concrete actions that China and Russia will take in the next decade that may not be represented in a, in a specific uh, 2050 goal, for example, are important. And those conversations are happening. And uh, Kerry was just speaking to the Russians uh, um, yesterday. So um, I would not uh, discount the fact that we will see further action and that progress is happening, even if it isn't on the larger stage. All right. Francis Cologne, thank you.